anybody here like me? If you had never seen a Larry Cohen film, you're going to be in for some really radically unique entertainment. Larry started as a writer, eventually became a director to protect Larry the writer. Yeah, shut up. We don't need all this bullshit. Bow. What was that? Larry Cohn is so much the invisible man. It's entirely possible to have seen a lot of his work without knowing you were seeing his work. His movies have this energy and this tact. Larry Cohn is like the white Martin Luther King for movies. I don't know what black exploitation means. Every movie is exploitation. So what? He's a madman, but he makes these great little films. There's a brilliance, there's a childish naughtiness about him. He would do things that were dangerous. Larry would not only shoot in the streets of New York, he would drive cars up on the sidewalk in the streets of New York. This is New York City. They just get out of the way when you're coming. I would go down to an area with 5,000 policemen and shoot a movie without permission. But Larry gave himself permission. Shell cartridges were raining down into the streets of New York. People think that there's a terrorist attack. He goes, get a cameraman and shoot somebody panicking. And then the next day, there were articles about it. They went, oh, Larry, you know. What you're really seeing is somebody who looks deeply at the present moment. Larry's movies are not necessarily subtle. They're thoughtful. They're reflections of the world around him and the problems in that world. All the movies I do take something which is considered benevolent and turning it into some kind of monstrosity. What? What? Every time I make a movie, they always tell me, that's not the way it's done. But I do it, and it works. He is the true independent filmmaker. He is jump out of the chopper, run and gun. Larry is the best guerrilla filmmaker in the business. A wild maverick sense in the tradition of the handmade picture. He trusts his actors, and they trust him. The greatest dead devil Hollywood has ever seen. The reality of life is you don't know all the answers. You don't know why these things occur. Let's face it, anybody will put up with anything if they think a movie is being shot. Why Larry Cohen? Why a documentary on the juggernaut of cinema? Uh, <laughs> the juggernaut of cinema. I I like that. I don't think anybody's used that phrase. Um, I he, will, of he course, is an unstoppable force. <laughs> oh, my nickname for Larry is he's the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going and going and going. Um, and he is he is unstoppable in that he has great will and determination. Uh, but that doesn't answer the initial question. And the initial question is why Larry Cohen? And my mm -hmm. glib response is why not? Um, you know. <laughs> Roger Cohen got his, uh, Roger Co Roger Corman. My God, that was a that was a faux pas of biblical proportion. Uh, Roger Corman got his own documentary, and I said to myself, I probably subconsciously, well, why not Larry? I mean, I knew Larry's work. I was a fan of Larry's work, and um, you know, the thing about Larry, unlike Roger, is that Larry writes, produces, and directs his own stuff whereas Roger produced and directed his own stuff. Now, Roger had more volume, but in some ways I always felt Larry had more quality. But Larry was also, you know, just a unique, idiosyncratic voice. And at the time that I did it, uh, well, the time I thought about it, I was looking for a project to do, you know. Sometimes in California and Hollywood and showbiz, you have to create your own work. And... Mm -hmm. uh, um, but it kind of got in my head uh, at the time that I thought about it. I was working for Image Entertainment, uh, uh, doing uh, special features and stuff. And um, basically, uh, I had this, you know, I was looking at, at Larry's IMDb page about something, and I had this idea, and it just wouldn't go away. So, you know, that's kind of how it got started. And eventually I got it financed and stuff like that. By the way, I'm hearing a buzz in the background. I'm not sure if that's me or you. Uh, let me see here. Hopefully that takes care of it. Hmm. Ambient noise. I hate that. <laughs> that's what, yeah, doing, them over, well, doing them over cell phones, always, it, it's always hit or miss. Right. Um, well, noise happens. 
yeah, it, that's 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 why I spend a lot of time with audio, just trying to get it as good as possible. Um, okay. Undertaking undertaking this task with getting so many people to talk about Larry, how difficult was that? Was was it pretty easy to get people to come out and speak about him, or was it a kind of you know it was, it was a mixed bag? It was mm-hmm. it was a mixed bag. I mean, some people uh, were relatively easy to contact. Some people were you know, quick to say, sure, okay. Um, and then some people we had to go, we kind of had, had to hunt for. Um, and then some people, you know, we, we would have hunted for kind of got dropped on our lap. Uh, Yasha Koto, for example, who was very, very unwilling to talk to anybody for any documentary, but because mm-hmm. he liked Larry, said, okay. Yasha happened to be uh, visiting the States. I think he was here looking for work. I think he was living somewhere out of the country. I'm not sure where. Um, and he was in town, and he got in touch with Larry because he's very fond of Larry. And then Larry said, you know, that, that we were doing a documentary about him. And, um, and, and Yafit agreed. And that's, apparently that's a big deal. Um, I think he, Yafit told me that Roger Moore asked him uh, to talk about you know, his experience on Live and Let Die for some documentary, and you have to turn him down. This is mm-hmm. Roger Moore, who, based on all reports, is like, was like one of the nicest guys in the entire world. Um, so, yeah, we were very lucky to get Yaffet, and that was, that was an interesting day. He's an interesting guy. Um, and then, well, finding Moriarty was, was quite the test, because Moriarty is a sort of self-imposed exile living in Canada now. Mm-hmm. And hang on, I'm going to call. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, but he has no representation. I mean, when he when he left the U.S., he sort of left the U.S. Um, in every way. And, you know, God bless Facebook. I was reading something one day, and I noticed, uh, you know, uh, Cinema Retro, which is a great magazine, by the way, uh, they were talking about how Moriarty uh, uh, blogs. You know, he does. You know, he he writes for a political blog. And I said, "Well, this is interesting." And they had the name of the blog. And I said to myself, "Why not send a, a you know Facebook message or an email to this blog and see if I can make a connection to Moriarty through the blog." And about 24 hours later, almost exactly 24 hours after I sent it, um, I was cutting. I was cutting with my editor, uh, Kai uh, Thomasian, and you know my smartphone lights up, and you know it, it it says Canada on it. I said, I said to Kai, I said, "Gee, I wonder if this is Moriarty." And uh, I pick it up and I say, "Hi, this is Steve." And you know, uh, I hear, hello, Steve, Michael Moriarty, how are you? And I said, fantastic, I've been looking for you everywhere. Now you found me. And we had a very pleasant conversation. He's, he's you know, he's a big fan of Larry's, and, you know, he, you know, he adores Larry. And um, I told him that I wanted to, do, well, that I wanted to talk to him and that I was doing this picture. And he said, well, send me the questions, and let me see if I think I can answer them. So I sent him, I don't know, 30, 35 questions. And he said, yeah, he think he'd be okay. So we went up to Canada and did the interview and, you know, spent a little quality time with him afterwards. And he's, he's a delightful guy. I'm, I'm very fond of Moriarty. And it was great to see him again in Montreal when we had our first screening at Fantasia. And it was great for Moriarty to, you know, hook up with Larry again. You know, obviously they're very fond of one another. So uh, that was, you know, that was part of our hunting and gathering. Larry helped us uh, get J.J. Abrams. Um, you know, we pursued Martin Scorsese for a long time, and eventually we got something from him. You know, uh, he really wanted to do it. It was just a matter of finding the time. So mm-hmm. whenever you do a project like this, there's a lot of, you know, easy gets and tougher gets um, when you do these things. I don't think I pursued Tony Lobianco hard enough, um, but he may have been out of town when I got in touch with him. Who knows? But I, sh- I still should have pursued him a little harder. I would have liked to have had Tony in the picture. 
Sharon Farrell uh, had agreed to do it and then uh, decided not to. Uh, I really wanted to talk to Joel Schumacher about phone booth, obviously. But at mm-hmm. the time, Joel was going through some uh, personal uh, issues um, and uh, wasn't really talking to anybody. So, you know, you never always get everybody that you want. And mm-hmm. uh, But I felt that we got a, we had a pretty good cast overall. You know, a friend of mine, you know, said to me, he said, he said, Steve, you're crazy. You've got, you've got, you know, you've got a great bunch of people. And I said, yeah, but you know, it's never enough. You know, you, you never always, know what you're going to get. Yeah, well, you never know what you're going to get, but you always want as many perspectives and points of view mm-hmm. as you possibly can. But at the at the end of the day, I still feel that we were able, with our cast, with our very able and generous cast, to uh, tell Larry's story, which was always the ultimate goal. Each guest was was very surprising, especially when Yaffa came on, because I I cannot honestly remember the last time that I saw him do anything besides the voiceover work he did for Alien Isolation, and even that was just very small. But just name after name, I was like, wow. And then when I didn't see Armando Asante, I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I sometimes you also say to yourself, is it worth going? to a lot of effort and, and expense. I mean, every time we, we had to do a shoot, you know, we had to, you know, pay our cameraman. There's usually one or two assistants. Uh, sometimes makeup is an issue. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, you can, you can shoot interview after interview after interview and just, you know, rack up expenses uh, on any of these things. But you have to get to a point where you say to yourself, okay, I think we're t- we're able to tell the story, and you know that's also where the cutting comes in. You know, you want to make it seem like, in a sense, that those people are in the movie even when they're not. You know, I was very lucky that Larry had a pretty extensive uh, archive, as I call it, of uh, behind-the-scenes stills and stuff like that, um, and that just ultimately helped us, you know, tell the tale. Uh, without having, you know, the people around. I mean, I got some great shots of Larry uh, with Joel. uh, And uh, then we had that, Larry had a great shot of him with Kiefer Sutherland, you know. And so, in a sense, visually, you can sort of have a person who's not in the documentary uh, represented in the documentary. So it's, it's it's all, you know, smoke and mirrors and, clever editing and everything like that. But, you know, somehow you have to sort of find a way to get it done and, and feel like you're telling the story, which is always the ultimate, uh, you know, destination for me, these things. You know, what is Larry like? Who is Larry, you know, as a creative force, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the footage that was used for a majority of the movies looks fantastic. Was uh, Where did the where did the, uh, the original footage come from? Was it from video releases or was it from a private archive somewhere? Cause those all that stuff looks amazingly clean. Um, well, you know, in today's high def world, you want to have material that looks the best it possibly can. Yeah, we mm-hmm. took advantage of what was out there, um, uh, and I think right towards the—I mean, actually, after uh, we did the festival trek, as I call it we managed to get access to some better footage, better quality footage, mm-hmm. which I'm going to yell I'm sorry. Um, it's early for me. Um, we were able to get some better quality footage that we uh, were able to put into uh, the documentary kind of at the last minute. Um, I would have loved to have had some better, you know, NYPD footage, even though we only looked at the, uh, title sequence, but NYPD was one of those shows that was notoriously well, it's notoriously out of print and home video. Mm-hmm. It's barely seen in syndication anymore. And um, the other thing is that it was shot in 16 millimeter back in the day. So that, that, that piece of logo that we have, that logo, but title sequence from NYPD, that's about the best we can find. We found some, you know, Cornet Blue had been released on DVD 
and so we were able to uh, you know use some of that. You know, you just look for the best stuff you can find, and we got lucky. I think is is basically what I'm trying to say. Were there any rights issues for some footage you couldn't use, or was it pretty easy to get everything you needed? Well, the whole reason the documentary exists on one level is that uh, filmmakers like myself can take advantage of the fair use laws. Fair use is a process where you make the movie, you submit the movie to lawyers who are steeped in fair use, and our lawyers uh, are um, the firm that we wound up going with. They are probably the one, the firm that is kind of at the vanguard of fair use law, and so much so that I think they go to Washington every two or three years, I believe it is, uh, to sort of expand, you know, the parameters of fair use. And so you have to go, you have to spend money on lawyers, which of course, you know, these days, and you know, everybody knows that lawyers are expensive. But, you know, our lawyers basically reviewed the movie, and they give us a document which says that the movie, uh, you know, falls you know, within the parameters of, of fair use. And they generate us uh, a document which, you know, gets us uh, insured. And, you know, this is not novel. Fair use law has been around for a long, long time. And a lot of documentaries that you see these days, entertainment documentaries, uh, take advantage of fair, fair use law. So it's a, very, it's a legitimate legal way to go do these things. And uh, without it, I never could have made the movie. Uh, wrapping up with my last two questions, uh, what was the most rewarding aspect of making this documentary for for you or for Larry? Well, I can't really speak for Larry. Um, I think I will say this. I know that Larry was very flattered uh, when I approached him. And um, I think most people, even, you know, regardless of where your ego is at, uh, would be flattered when somebody essentially knocks on your door and says, hey, I think you've had a great career, and hey, we want to make a movie about you. Um, so I, I know that Larry is flattered, um, and, and Larry likes the picture, although I think Larry wishes we had done a mini series covering <laughs> every single thing that he's ever written. And by the way, there's a lot of stuff that he did that we couldn't really cover in any any detail. You know, you have to try and be responsible to creating a, you know, a narrative with a certain rhythm and a certain pace. And then, you know, let's face it, most documentaries, um, not all, but most, uh, especially if they're created as features, people, I think, get nervous when they run a whole lot longer than about an hour and 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And hours is somewhere in that neighborhood. I, mean, I never really know what the final running time is. I think it's like an hour and forty-three minutes, give or take. Yeah, it's, it's one forty. It's close to one forty-five. Yeah, I watched it that. Okay. Video. Okay, fine. So yeah, I mean, listen, I could have, I could have made a two and a half hour documentary about Larry and not broken a sweat, <laughs> but I just think it would be, it would have been. Then, then it's becoming more like a document. Um, you know, if you're doing something for HBO, you can do things in two parts. You know, if you're doing something for, you know, for television, I think you can generate something that, that is, you know, more than, more than feature length. But, you know, we're making a feature. And I think one of the things that you have to try and remember is better to have the audience want more at the end than to be tired of it. Uh, but I do have, I did have, with Larry alone, I had hours and hours and hours of, of, of footage that I didn't use. And there were some great anecdotes, which I couldn't use. But, again, pace and rhythm dictated a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So Larry, I think, would have preferred it to have been an epic, you know, you know, 10-part miniseries. But uh, that's not what we set out to do. Now, getting back to the, you know, circling back to your question, which was you know, what was gratifying about me, not not about me, for me, was, um, well, Larry, you know, kind of getting to know Larry has, has, was very gratifying for me. I mean, I knew his work. I, I knew that from a career standpoint, 
he would probably be pretty interesting just because of the work. But what I discovered was that he's kind of this very interesting guy and an interesting character. Um, as he, you know, we talk about the movie, he started as a stand-up, and he still has that stand-up, uh, a stand-up perform- uh, comedian's, um, you know, kind of DNA in him. He's he's always sort of on, and he's always performing. And I think once a performer, always a performer. And so the, the, that side of Larry, uh, I, I I didn't quite expect, and I've come to enjoy, you know, and. And the other thing is that, that he's a big movie fan, and I'm a big movie fan. And I'm I'm pretty good. I can I, I think I can I can dance with anybody when it comes to talking about old movies. And he once said to me, we were disagreeing about something. He says, if I want you to disagree with me, I'll tell you, which of course made me laugh. Um, but you know, he's just a very interesting guy, and I think all I think all stories, you know, circling again back to the pictures, is whether you're making fiction or nonfiction, usually at the center of any successful piece of storytelling are interesting characters. And Larry, for sure, is an interesting character. And then, of course, a lot of our cast members turned out to be pretty interesting, like Fred Williamson and Michael and Yaffa and, you know, so many others. And so that was, as a fan, I kind of got to know so many interesting things about Larry. I got to know so many anecdotes first. You know, that's if you if you're you have to have some kind of fuel to get through these things. And my fuel was always, you know, I'm in the audience for this picture. If I didn't make this picture, I'd run out to go see this picture. And so what happened was I got to hear a lot of stuff that ultimately didn't use, which was interesting. But also stuff that we will try and you know we're going to have quite a few deleted scenes uh, on the blu-ray and so that way you know people can hear some of those anecdotes which i'm sure larry would uh you know would love for you know fans to hear so yeah just the larry, the whole larry experience has been a lot of fun and uh and then of course it's very gratifying that people see the movie and they like the movie you know uh, i'll tell you a little anecdote i don't know if we'll how we're doing on time, but oh, uh, we uh, we took the picture up to Montreal to the uh, Fantasia uh, Festival up there, and we were about to screen it, and it was in a pretty good sized theater, and it was a nice sized crowd, and you know, I, strangely enough, I was not feeling nervous, and because I felt pretty good about the picture, I mean, enough people who I trust had seen it, and they thought they said, "Hey, you did a good job," which is of course always gratifying. But there was a moment, I don't know, it was about 10 minutes before we got started where all of a sudden I was starting to feel a bit nervous. <laughs> and going, what if they don't like it? You know, what if they think it stinks? Um, you know, because you never know. And pretty much once the logo came on and the music started, and, you know, we had the JJ story, and, you know, the audience started to laugh in the right places. And I don't know, in about the first five minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, whatever it is, it seemed to be working for me. And uh, not working for me, it worked for me, but it seems to be working for the audience. And that worked for me. Because at the end of the day, the audience tells you whether or not you made a good picture. The audience will determine whether or not something is a good piece of work. I mean... Mm -hmm. And I remember I had done some writing some years ago, uh, some animation work, and I think I turned in the first script. And uh, my story editor, he said, so what do you think of it? And I go, what do you mean? He says, well, is it any good? <laughs> and I immediately was thinking, well, isn't he going to read it? Isn't he going to tell me if it's any good? And I said, well, to tell you the truth, I don't know. I feel pretty good about it. I think it works, but I don't know if it's any good. Well, I think any creative person, they they put a certain amount of time and effort and, and inspiration and craft into what they do. But in, in the end, the audience is going to tell you if it's any good. So uh, when the audience up in Montreal was sort of laughing in the right places, uh, I don't know, it was somewhere around 20 minutes into the picture. Moriarty was sitting in front of me at the screening. 
and he turned around and he goes, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. And I think that was the moment where I was able to actually sort of exhale and, and feel fairly comfortable. And then everybody since then has, has told me how much they liked the movie, which, of course, you know, there isn't a filmmaker on the planet that, that wouldn't say how relieved and but gratified they feel by that kind of response. Because, you know, you never know. Yeah, when for guys like me that get screeners on a daily basis, it's always there's always a certain amount of dread, no matter what, because we have to commit ourselves to watching whatever we're sent if we're going to do our jobs correctly. And I was I was thoroughly entertained all the way through it. I just people would call and I'd be like, you just leave me alone. I'm trying to watch this. This is so in, it's, it's enthralling. <laughs> just stop. I like. Uh, I was like, oh, I have an interview. Well, we're going to have to reschedule because if I lose track of this, I'm not – it's going to be so hard. I'm going to have to start over because it had me so entrenched that I didn't want to break that connection. Because it, it's hard sometimes to get a connection with a film where you're just like, there's got to be more after this. There, there has to be There has to be stuff on the cutting room floor that I have to see. There has to be deleted scenes that I, I've just – I've got to know more about this man's career because someone that has that amount of creative energy that can sit down and his writing process is basically just pen to paper and that's it. That is, that astounds me as a writer. There is, I I don't have that kind of skill and it's so intriguing when someone does, when someone can have that much creative output and they just don't stop. Like I said at the beginning, he's just a juggernaut of creative energy that, that he's still going. (laughs) Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And most of my friends uh, are creative uh, individuals, and a great many of them are writers. Uh, I used to work in the comic book business in my previous life, and I think there's some guys who just have stories in them that they're just pushing their way out. And then I think some writers have only so many stories in them that they need to tell. Mm -hmm. They may have more stories in there that they want to tell, but, you know, I think things get done based on need and that's and it's subjective and it's internal and you know it can't be determined it just kind of is or it isn't i mean i'm one of those guys um but i'm no i but and and i'm in awe of larry because larry can just churn out stories and it's not he's not a hack he's not a you know volume guy where he writes you know by the pound so to speak he just has these tales in him that push their way out and Mm -hmm. um as as a guy who sat at a at a you know at a desk with a typewriter or a keypad or or a legal pad um it's it's tough just in general on a good day it's tough and i just admire the fact that he just you know goes about his business kind of like Mel Brooks and Blazing Saddles, where he's going to sit there at his desk. He's going, work, 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 work. And I just, I'm in awe of that on a lot of levels. And and I mm-hmm. think that that aspect of who Larry is, is that, that alone is, is pretty remarkable. But yet somehow he went out there and then he actually made his pictures and he made them in, you know, in the Larry Cohen way. And mm-hmm. I think somebody... You know, we were talking about how that at the end of all of his movies, there's this card. It says a Larry Cohen film. Usually you cut the black and then, you know, the card comes up. Well, lots of people take possessory credit uh, with their movies. And let's face it, everybody earns it to one degree or another. But in, in the case of Larry, he really earns that credit. When it says a Larry Cohen film, it's a Larry Cohen film. If you like it, well, it's because it's a Larry Cohen film. If you don't like it, it's probably because it's a Larry Cohen film. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be the first one to say, I'm not, I don't like all of Larry's movies. I like most all of Larry's movies. And I won't tell you the ones I don't like because it's not fair to Larry. But I'll tell you the one thing about all of Larry's movies. Walk out of a Larry Cohen movie and... They are never empty calories. You can't just dismiss them. They are the work of an auteur, and that's a term that gets used a lot and misused a lot. But in Larry's case, it is an earned credit, and I've always admired that about him. I think the first time I saw 
I saw Larry Cohen feature. I think it was, I think it was back when they reissued It's Alive. I think that was the first Larry movie I'd seen. And at the end, it says a Larry Cohen film. And because I'm a credits junkie, that made a that really stamped itself on my psyche. And I said, oh, I got to see more work by this guy. <laughs> and so I always was on the hunt to see a Larry Cohen movie when I could or catch up with something that he did when I could. And um, it's because, like other great filmmakers, you know, his stories go through his filters, and who Larry is comes out through all his films. And when I was, when I was, you know, growing up, you know, when I was, you know, my, when I was having my cinema education in the 70s, you know, when that was the decade where there was an awful lot of auteur work being done in America as well as offshore. Uh, Larry was one of those guys whose work I always looked for. You know, I'll tell you. I'll tell you another anecdote if we have time about this. Sure. Um, I dedicated the movie to a guy named Bob Sheridan. Bob was my writing partner on uh, on a movie uh, called Against the Law. But we were old time pals from New York, and he was a uh, you know, big movie fan. And and you know, we loved talking about movies, oftentimes because we disagreed about stuff. <laughs> but it was always stimulating. So one day. We were going to go, we were, you know, going to set about writing this picture against the wall. But we always left a half an hour, 45 minutes in the front end of the work day just to kind of get caught up with one another. And so uh, Bob said to me, he says, uh, he says, oh, I, uh, I saw this, uh, this new uh, Larry Cohen movie the other night. And I said, what was that? And he said, uh, and I think he might have seen it on video or television. He says, oh, it was... Uh, because uh, he had this halting way of speaking. He says, uh, perfect strangers. He said, perfect strangers I've never heard of. He says, neither had I. And, you know, that was one of two of Larry's, I call New York Underground pictures, which were really done on the down low. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure they got much of a release, but, you know, like, you know, who knows. So I said, so what did you think? And he and he sort of thought about it, and he nodded his head, and he kind of he went ooh, uh, duh, ooh, um, and then he said, "It's a Larry Cohen film," and I knew exactly what he meant, and that's why Larry's credit at the end of his pictures is really earned, because you know they are for better or for worse all Larry Cohen films. They're they're undeniably Larry Cohen movies when you see them, and I didn't understand that when I was a kid when I first started watching his movies because I grew up in the back of a video store. So oh, movies, sure. were my, oh. movies were my babysitter. So I remember one of the, probably the third or fourth quote unquote horror movie I watched was The Stuff, mainly because of the cover artwork. I just grabbed it and picked it up and just think about it. I was like, this really isn't a horror movie. It's something else. And at that time, I, I didn't understand satire that well because I was a really young kid. But as I watch it now, I'm like, wow, that's, that that is amazingly relevant for today. And then when I started watching the rest of his uh, lexicon, I was like, he is astoundingly relevant 30, 40 years after these movies were made. I wish I wish I could have that kind of staying power with anything that I ever produced, which I know I will. Well, but... or 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 precognic or precognition type powers or precognitive mm-hmm. powers. Um, well, but what you're saying is what I was saying earlier that like them, not don't like them, like some of them, they're always about something. There's always something going on in a Larry Cullen picture. That's why they're not empty calories. You know, you bring something away from uh, a screening of a Larry Cullen movie, whether you see the theater and you're on your way home or whether or not you're walking to the kitchen to make some more popcorn after the movie's over or whatever it is. You know, there's something about his movies that stay with you, and that's what great movies do. They kind of get sometimes on your skin or then under your skin. Um, but they're not – most of Larry's movies are not disposable, and I think that's why his stuff kind of endures. I mean, that's, I think, it, you know, on a subconscious level, might be where my uh, enthusiasm doing the project started out because I – was looking again at his IMDb credits, and I, again, knocked out by the amount of 
credits of his that I didn't know. I knew all the features pretty much, but he did so much television work that I didn't know, or he wrote some other things that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Um, There were even, I think, a couple of TV series in there that I, I wasn't even aware of. And so basically just kind of get a, when you get immersed in Larry, um, it doesn't go away. And I think that day when I looked at that IMDB page, you know, I was at the very least intrigued by the idea of doing a feature. Mm-hmm. And it took a little while to kind of get it on its feet financially, which, by the way, if you talk to any filmmaker these days, the toughest thing about making any movie is getting it financed. <laughs> you know, st- strangely enough for me, the movie took basically a couple of years to make. A lot of it was editing. Um, the hunting and the gathering of the cast was part of that, but most of it was editing because there was no script. We made the picture in the uh, in the editing room. I mean, I knew I was going to use Larry's career as the spine, but other than that, there was an awful lot of uh, cutting sequences and then you know recutting sequences or throwing stuff out. And starting from scratch, um, I'll tell you one quick anecdote: is we, had, uh, my my editor Kai and I had uh, spent a couple of days working on the Sam Fuller sequence for the uh, third It's Alive movie. No, it was Salem's mm-hmm. Lot. Sorry, those movies were made back to back, so I sometimes confuse them. No, it was uh, uh, it was Salem's Lot, and we were focusing on Larry's relationship with Sam Fuller. Um, and we thought, we did what we thought was a pretty good job with it. In fact, I remember it was a Friday. I was going home. I said to him, I said, I think it works. I think it's pretty good. And he just he thought about it for a second. He said, really? Are you sure? Because he goes, I'm not so sure. And I said, okay, well, let's we'll look at it on Monday. We basically threw it out and recut the whole thing. Because one of the things that um, I had an agreement with my editor in the beginning, I said we both have to like it. If you, you know, I told I told Kai, I said if it's twitchy or uncomfortable or something's bugging you uh, about the way the way sequence is cut, let's talk about it and go back and look at it because that was our our. I guess I would.